word for that, wow. That was beautiful. Thank you for leading us in worship. That was incredible. Thank you. Today is a special day. It's Pentecost Sunday. And yet it is a day where there are some churches in our country that are facing challenges that we're not facing here in Jackson. Many of you know that Rainey and I moved here a few weeks ago from Houston, Texas. And it's been a tough weekend for those in Houston, Texas. They had a, a storm on Thursday night. And uh, many of you have asked, our daughter is fine. She got electricity back yesterday and she was safe. Those, the wind blew her over uh, to the ground one occasion. We have friends whose cars, the hood blew off the car as they were driving. We had trees, the friends, the homes that were demolished with the trees. And the churches in Houston are not just celebrating Pentecost Sunday, but they're having to, to help in the aftermath of the storm. So I want you to indulge me, if you will, and join me in praying for those churches in Houston who will be taking care of their flock in a different way this week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege it is to pray for other churches in another part of the country going through a difficult time. And I pray for second, I pray for others in that city that are dealing with the aftermath of the storm, not just in a physical way, but emotionally and spiritually as well. So I pray for the pastors and the leaders of that community, that you would empower them, that you'd give them wisdom and discernment as they navigate the days ahead. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for letting me do that. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and it's a day that we're continuing our series called God's Interruptions. And, and with this particular Sunday, when we look at Pentecost, most people, if you're familiar with Pentecost, you think of the book of Acts, and specifically Acts chapter 2. And that's going to be our passage today, Acts chapter 2. However, when you think about Acts chapter 2, if you were to read the book of Acts, you would merely turn the page and you appear at Acts chapter 2. But for those living it out in the first century, what takes place in Acts chapter 2 is much more than merely turning the page. Because Pentecost was a, a festival that had been inaugurated and established all the way back in the days of Moses. In the Old Testament, it was called the Festival of Weeks. And with this, it was to take place 50 days after the Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. You can look at it in, in Leviticus chapter 23 for the establishment of this particular feast. We're not going to read from Leviticus 23 today. You're welcome for that. But if you were to go back and read that, it was something that God's people did year after year, decade after decade, generation after generation, all the way up to the first century. And in the first century in Israel, it was a feast that, that the Jews would gather together from all over the area to Jerusalem to celebrate that 50 days after the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The way we get the term Pentecost is it's the Greek word for 50th. And so for those living in that particular day, it was more than just turning the page. For those 11 remaining disciples, if you remember two weeks ago, we looked at Matthew chapter 28, referred to as the Great Commission. We call it ready, set, go, where Jesus was with his 11 disciples that were remaining on the side of the hill in Galilee. And he was sharing with them what he wanted them to do, what they were prepared to do, to be set to do, and to go and do. And after the, the resurrection, Jesus had been with the people different times. He appeared for several different occasions. He, he had traveled with his disciples up in Galilee. But in Acts chapter 1, he brings them all the way back to Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 1, Jesus is telling those 11 remaining disciples to stay in Jerusalem. He tells them, don't leave Jerusalem and to wait. Wait for what the Father had promised. And he goes on to tell them that John baptized with water, but they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And that's the phrase that he used. He wasn't specific in how many days. He just said that you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. He would go on to say that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. 
And the final words of Jesus were this, that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And in Acts chapter 1, 9, he ascends into heaven. And those 11 remaining disciples, they follow him up, and as he ascends, they're just gazing into the heavens. And two men dressed in white say, why are you looking up there? You have some work to do. The end of, of chapter 1 of Acts, they gather together 120 believers, and out of that group, they add one more to the apostleship, and, and so the number goes back up to 12. And then we turn the page to Acts chapter 2. And that is the context in which we see this day of Pentecost. A lot has transpired over the last 50 days. There's been a lot going on in the lives of those believers. And so let's go to that moment in Acts chapter 2. I'm going to ask that you stand for the reading of God's word. Acts chapter 2, beginning verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together, and they were bewildered because each of them was hearing them speak in his own language. Now they were amazed and astonished, saying, why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea, Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongue speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And when they continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, they were full of sweet wine. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. When we think of this particular day, we, we, we think of them gathering together in this moment. We, we think of all that, that Jesus had told them, all that he had challenged them to do. And this, this day was a festival like no other day. This was a day that, that they had never seen before, though they had experienced the Feast of Weeks throughout their lives. It was part of their heritage. But on this day, if you look back at verse 1, it says that they were all gathered together on that day. They were there to, to observe Pentecost, which was already part of their heritage. But what they did not expect on that day, they didn't expect to be interrupted by God. They were going through the traditions and the heritage of their faith. Now those 11 remaining disciples heard Jesus say that they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. They heard that. But then it was one day, nothing happened. Two days, nothing happened. Three days, nothing happened. Four days, five days, six days, seven days, still nothing happened. Eight days, nine days, nothing happened. Ten days, it was Pentecost. They did what good Jewish people and, and followers of God did. They celebrated the Feast of Weeks. And it was there. In the gathering of 120 believers, if you look at the context of Acts chapter 1 and 2, in Acts chapter 1 verse 15, we're told there was 120 believers that were gathered together. And in that group of believers, God interrupted them, collectively as a group. And so we ask ourselves, what happens when God interrupts a group of believers? Again, if you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 1, verse 2, it says, Suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, 
and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now, the word suddenly lets us know they didn't expect it. There, there was no committee that was gathered together to plan and organize this event. In fact, there was no one that even prayed for this event to happen. This was a complete surprise. It was a complete interruption by God to a collective group of believers doing what they would do every year at this time, 50 days after the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And God showed up. And, and Luke is trying to give us a point of reference here as he writes the book of Acts. For those of us who were not there, he, he's saying that this noise came from heaven. He wants to make sure that we realize it's not coming from the doorway. It's not coming from uh, the, the windows. That this noise is coming from heaven above. In fact, this noise is, is like a violent, rushing wind. Now, it's not a wind. We know by Scripture that no one uh, was harmed in this. There was no destruction in this. There was nothing like what Houston saw on Thursday night, that there was any trees or buildings going over, nothing like that. But the sound was that of a noise as loud as a violent rushing wind. Then he goes on to say in, in verse 3, And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. Now, now with this, these are, are not necessarily tongues of fire, but again, he wants to give us a point of reference. He wants us to see how unusual this moment is, how holy this moment is. And he says it's like, like tongues as of fire. For instance, if, if you've ever gone camping and you build a campfire, and you are fortunate enough to actually get the fire going, that with a campfire, there's only one source for that fire, but the flames are going in all directions. That's the picture that Luke is painting here. It's his tongues as a fire. There's one source that it's coming from, but it's coming in all different directions. And notice that which had happened to the group collectively now becomes individual. Did you catch what it said? It says the tongues as a fire rest on each one of them. If it were to happen in, in the sanctuary here today, we have a whole lot more than 120 people, but that means that, that it would rest on each one of you and each one of you and each one of you. And for the orchestra and the choir, everywhere you are, God would touch you right where you are. It was an individual moment for them. Collectively, they were interrupted, but individually, they were interrupted as well by the finger of God, the touch of God, the spirit of God. Then in verse 4, it says, And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Not just some of them. It wasn't just the apostles that were filled with the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just the religious leaders that were filled with the Holy Spirit. It was all of them. It wasn't just those that, that were married or those that were employed or those that could play in the orchestra. It was all, all. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a reminder that God is in the individual business. That when we become a believer, when we are in the presence of God, He deals with us as an individual. And even here, though collectively their lives were interrupted as a group, but God touched them individually. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to, te to speak in another tongue as the Spirit would give them utterance. I want to be very clear in this passage. The language that they were going to speak, it was not a heavenly language. It was not a, a special prayer language. It's very clear in this passage, it was an earthly language. It, it was a miracle what was happening, but it was a miracle with a message. That God wanted to communicate his message, his truth, his grace, his mercy, his mighty acts of deed. He wanted to communicate that to every single person who was there, wherever they were from. And we're told that they were from, from 15 different locations at a minimum. 
One of the reasons I read the entire passage so you could see that they were from all over. If you were to put that up on a map, it would be the north and the south, the east and the west. They would have to cross other countries to get there, in fact. And it's a reminder of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It didn't matter your background, your heritage, uh, what language you spoke. The message was the same for every single one of them. And the miracle was that they heard that message. If you look at verse 11 towards the end, it says that we got to hear them in our own tongues, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. Now, when it says that, it does not mean that they heard a language that they did not understand. It means they heard a language they did understand in their native tongue. For instance, if you were from Paris, France, your native tongue would be French. That's your, your first language. For those of you born in, in Mississippi, your native tongue is Mississippi English. Mississippi English is a little bit different from Texas English, but nevertheless, that's your native tongue. And why he's saying that, that you who have only spoken Mississippi English, you've never learned another language, at this moment when the Holy Spirit filled you with this miraculous power for this opportunity on this day, that instantly instead of Mississippi English, you're able to speak Farsi. You're able to speak, speak Portuguese. You can speak Czech. You can speak Spanish. God had brought these people from all parts of the world, north, south, east, and west, to Jerusalem to hear the mighty acts of God in their own language. And when they heard about God, when they heard about his power, when they saw and understood what was going on, they asked a question, what does this mean? For many of them, probably the first time they ever really heard it in that way, in a way they truly understood. And when they heard it, they, they asked that question, but then, as is the case even today, in 2024, when God moves in, in someone's life and when God moves collectively in the group of believers, such as the church, there are going to be people who will mock and stir things up. They'll make fun of you. It was true then. It says, ah, they must be a little drunk on some sweet wine. And I'm glad that the question was asked, and I'm glad that some people mock them. It shows the accuracy of what happened, but it also gave Peter an opportunity to stand up. And they we're not going to read his sermon, Peter stands up in a way he's never stood up before. The last time that Peter is spoken about specifically, individually, in Scripture before this moment is recorded in John 21. And Rocky preached that sermon just a few weeks ago. It's when Jesus appeared to, to seven disciples who were out fishing and not having any luck whatsoever. And Jesus is on the shore, and, and they eventually understand that it's Jesus, Peter himself, the boat, he swims and, and is with Jesus. Jesus had made a charcoal fire. And they eventually caught some fish with the help of Jesus, and, and they had breakfast. And then Jesus took Peter off to the side and asked him that question, do you love me? And Peter said, you know I love you, but as Rocky pointed out, if you remember, the word that Jesus used for love was the word agape. It's a sacrificial kind of love. The word that Peter used for love is phileo, which is a brotherly, friendly kind of love. And Jesus asked a second time, do you love me? Again, using the word agape, and Peter said, I love you, but he used the word phileo. The third time, Jesus met Peter right where he was. He says, do you love me? And this time, Jesus used the word phileo, and Peter said, you know I love you, and used the word phileo. But each time, Jesus said, tend my sheep, feed my sheep, shepherd my sheep. Now, on Pentecost, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. And as Jesus had promised that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them, and Peter spoke with a power that he never had before. He spoke with a boldness he never had before, with a confidence and authority that he never had before. 
And he lets them know that it's not because of wine, they are not drunk, but it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that they're able to do this. He proceeds to preach a sermon that he takes them back to the prophet Joel, and he explains some of the prophecy of Joel. He takes them to the psalmist, to David, and, and explains some of the psalms. But most importantly, he takes them to the cross. He takes them to Jesus Christ and the signs and the wonders and the miracles of Jesus. But beyond that, he takes them to the cross and the sacrifice of Jesus. He takes them to the death of Jesus and the burial of Jesus. And he tells about the resurrection of Jesus. He closes out his sermon and he says that Jesus, not only the Son of God, Jesus is the Lord and Christ the Messiah. Jesus is the one that we've been waiting for. Jesus is the one that the prophets foretold. Jesus is the one that we have awaited for all of these generations, and this is Jesus Christ. And when they heard the truth, when they heard the gospel, when they heard the power of Peter proclaiming all of that truth, it says that their hearts were pierced. If you if you look at verse 37 in Acts 2, 237 says, Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? When Scripture says that their hearts were pierced, it does not mean that as they heard this sermon, they just felt kind of a little nudge from somebody and said, That was pretty good, wasn't it? You feel better, don't you? It wasn't that. When they heard the truth of the gospel, when they heard the truth of the Spirit of God, their hearts were pierced. And, and the word pierced, it means stabbing. It's to penetrate. Not just to nudge, but to penetrate. And every single one of us, wherever we are, every single one of us, we have layers upon layers upon layers in our life. That emotionally, we, we have these layers that kind of stacked up. If you ever heard of the phrase and in Scripture when it says someone's heart was hardened, it's those layers. And if you think about emotional layers that every single one of us have, some of them caused by trauma from over the years. Some from betrayal of someone that we trusted. Some are, those layers are based on beliefs that are lies. Sometimes those layers are based on, on mindsets that, that are inaccurate. Layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And when they heard the truth, their hearts were pierced. And so it's this stabbing that goes layer after layer after layer after layer after layer below the surface and down and down and down to the heart. In a physical way, it would go through the flesh, layer after layer after layer, through the bone, layer after layer, and penetrate the heart. They were moved to the depths of their soul. And as a result, they, they asked the question, what shall we do? What do we do now? What do we do with this? And Peter responded in verse 38. Peter said to them, repent each of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. And pause there. We don't know how long he spoke, but we know that the first word out of his mouth was repent. He said, you need to make a choice. And the word repent means not just turning away, but it's turning away from something and turning towards something else. So in the spiritual sense, you're turning away from the world, turning away from the culture, turning away from the wickedness, and you turn your lives to Jesus. And when you turn your lives to Jesus to follow him, that which changes in the mind changes in the heart. That which changes in the heart changes in the behavior. And it changes your priorities. It changes your relationships. It changes the way you make decisions. 
It changes your life. And, and on this particular day, in verse 41, it says, So then those who received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. And that, my friends, is the birth of the church. Because of Pentecost, because of what happened on that day, we have Christ united here at 6,000 Old Canton Road. We, we have church because we are a byproduct of that birth. That is our heritage. That's where it began. And then we see the change in their lives in verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to prayer. Four pillars of a church. And this continually devoting means that it became part of their lifestyle. It became part of their priorities. That they would revolve their life around these four things. They wanted to hear the, the teaching from the apostles. In our day, it would be to come on Sunday morning to hear the preacher preach God's word. And my commitment to you, when you do that, and I hope that becomes part of your uh, activity every single week, but when you come here, I promise, I will be prepared and I will, to my best ability, by the grace of God, divide accurately the word of God. They made it a priority. Second thing they did was fellowship. They wanted to, to be with like-minded people and do life together. We do that best here at Christ United through Sunday school classes, where you connect, you do life together, you fellowship with one another. You're able to dig into truths of Scripture in a way that we can't do here in a big setting. And, and so they were committed to fellowship together. They were also committed to breaking the bread together. It wasn't just eating meals together, but it was to remember what Jesus Christ had instituted in the upper room where he broke bread and, and he shared the cup. And they did that continually. I love that that is part of who we are at Christ United. The first Sunday of every month, we do Holy Communion. It's a way to remember and to reflect and to be part of that heritage and a reminder of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And then prayer. It's last, but it's not least. In fact, I believe it's foundational. When the church was born, they became a people in a group of prayer. And I can think of no greater compliment for when people talk about Christ United, that that's the church who prays. That's the church who seeks God. And I, I love the fact that we have the opportunity even today to put into practice these four pillars. That is a church that we have that choice. For Acts chapter 2, for those believers on that day of Pentecost, it was the birth of the church. For us today, at Christ United, my prayer, it's the rebirth of this church. That is a renewal, it's a revival, it's an opportunity to recommit to those pillars. And what better way than to be a people of prayer? So I'm going to ask that in this closing song, that, that we have an altar down front. It's not just for decoration, but it's an opportunity for you to come and to be in the posture of prayer. You can obviously pray where you are, but I want us collectively as a group to be people and a church of prayer. So as God leads, I want you to to do that. There's no sin, no one's going to think, oh, what's wrong with them? It's a time for you and God to connect. Because we ask the question, what happens when God interrupts a group of believers? For them, a church was born. For us, at Christ United, a church is a reborn. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, your truth. Thank you for touching us collectively and yet individually. And so it is our prayer that you will take each one of us and grow us and nurture us, revive us individually and collectively to be a light in this community and to be your church. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit that was poured upon us, amen.